I'm from the University of Leuven and Leuven is like a, a two and a half hour drive from here. It's very easy to reach. Uh, if I come to Luxembourg, it's also two and a half hours if there are no traffic jams uh, starting on the Luxembourg border as, as today. Uh, but it's, it's not so far away. Um, ESAT is the electrical engineering department in Leuven. Um, uh, we have um, a, a very large department. We are with about 50 professors and together we have about 500 PhD students and it's everything that you can see under the broad umbrella of uh, electrical engineering. So it can be data science, it can be uh, uh, power engineering, it can be telecommunications. I mean, everything what is traditionally be considered to be electrical engineering. Stadius is the name of a medieval professor and I'm not going to elaborate on that, but he was kind of famous uh, mathematician engineer in the in the in the 16th century uh, in Leuven and we thought it was a very good name that we could use for our research group. You also see iMinds there. iMinds is a strategic research center in uh, Flanders. Uh, we have five uh, strategic research centers and um, maybe you know iMEC which is the nanotechnology uh, center. iMinds is the ICT center and it's a distributed center. So basically these are centers of excellence uh, all over Flanders where they recruit um, 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 excellent research groups from the universities and I'm the director of the medical IT department in that uh, uh, research center. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, maybe a little bit provocative uh, uh, a title uh, saying serious data and, and serious mining and I hope that at the end of my presentation you kind of understand what I mean by serious. I have already gotten quite some critique on this title because then people who don't recognize themselves in the presentation think that they are doing not serious things. Uh, so, but that's not an implication you should make from, uh, from this title. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly to the first couple of slides because these are, let's say, the generic type of uh, uh, slides that explain a little bit the complexity uh, that you are confronted with when you are doing uh, serious data and serious mining. And then in the second part of my presentation, and that's maybe the more interesting part, I will give you uh, an overview of applications, of some applications, not all of them, that we have been doing the last uh, 20 uh, years. So of course I don't have to convince this audience I hope about the relevance of big data and maybe uh, Bjorn we should, can we, no, I, I need an expert here. <laughs> if, we, if we kill the lights here then it's better. So basically what you see here is a, a very nice uh, uh, a movie which shows the um, activity on the internet uh, during day and night over the world. And you see that uh, uh, red uh, is activity during the day, blue is, is during the night. And you see that there is a cycle, of course, of increasing internet traffic and we move around data in an increasing uh, uh, pace uh, all over the world. And um, for general audiences, I always like to give this slide also because it, it re really tells you uh, that we have to learn to think in new orders of magnitude because when you, you, we use the word terabyte and, and petabyte, uh, basically uh, very few people realize how much data that that is. For instance, one petabyte of data is three year music, continuous time, 24 hours a day, three years in a CD quality. So that gives you an idea about the number of data. A large university library uh, is, is about uh, one megabyte and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, we have new evolutions. The Internet of Things is, is there to come uh, and that will connect uh, everybody with every other object and every other person. And that will, of course, uh, increase uh, the number of data that's floating around uh, uh, worldwide and between all kinds of uh, devices. And that's, of course, uh, another revolution that is going to come in this age of uh, information uh, technology. And I'm not go going to elaborate on, on the details here. Uh, by the way, I can make the presentation available later so that all the details I skip can be uh, checked up uh, later. And this will, of course, give a kind of exponential uh, explosion of uh, the number of uh, data and you see there uh, smartphones that that's the current age tablets is also starting internet of things is about to start and wearables if you think about all kinds of wearables in health and other applications that's of course another type of explo uh, exponential data uh, increase <clears throat> now there are two other things that govern us 
technological laws. Uh, one of them you all know, it's, it's Moore's law. And Gordon Moore was the founder of uh, Intel. And in the 60s, he predicted based on four data points. So he was a very good data scientist. He predicted based on four observations that every 18 months, the, the capacity of our computer, of our chips would double. Uh, if you want to know what this means in terms of bank accounts, it's an interest rate of 56%. So I tell my students, when you know a bank that gives you an interest rate of 56%, don't tell anybody uh, because you will not be able to keep that rate. But that's a really big driver of technology. It, it's, a, it's an exponential increase of computational power every 18 months. Now, if you look at another discipline like uh, biotechnology, there it's called Carlson's law, and there it's even faster. So in biotechnology, the number of data doubles every year. So it's an interest rate of 100%. And uh, basically, the, the price, uh, for instance, to sequence um, uh, genomes, that halves every year. So that becomes cheaper and cheaper. So the time that we can routinely sequence a complete human genome, for instance, of all newborn babies in a country, uh, the time that that will only cost $1,000 for full genome sequencing is very nearby. Okay, So it's really uh, decreasing uh, very rapidly. And here we have an example of that. If I just take a genome data as an example, you all remember the Human Genome Project um, of uh, about 15 years ago that was announced by, by Bill Clinton. There were two type of competing consortia. And that whole project that took 13 years for the first human genome to be sequenced, uh, and that cost about $300 million. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, James Watson, the guy of uh, Crick and Watson fame, the double helix, he sequenced his own genome, and that, cost, uh, that took two months and cost about uh, uh, $1 million. And it's expected that one of the coming years we will do that routinely for $1,000. So that gives you a kind of uh, uh, visualization of the exponential decrease uh, in uh, cost uh, to sequence a, a full genome. A full genome, you know that the genome consists of four letters. It's an alphabet of four letters, A, C, T, and G. You can code that with two bits, OK? A full genome is about 750 megabytes if you do it with two bits. That fits on one CD-ROM, OK? That's the thing you can remember. But of course, when you do it, you have to use redundancy. There's lots of noise in these um, uh, measurements. And then basically, a genome is about one terabyte. If you really want to use it for clinical purposes, you need a, a lot of redundancy. And that's much more than 750 megabytes. And that's illustrated on this slide where you have several uh, biotechnologi biotechnologically inspired numbers. Uh, for instance, the PAC system in our university hospital, that's a system of all the uh, images, the medical images, that's about 1.6 petabyte. I mean, that's all the radiographies, all the NMR, scan NMR scans and so on. If we would decide in Belgium to sequence all the uh, newborn babies by 2020, that's about 125,000 births per year, that would generate about 125 petabyte of data. And now you will ask yourself, why would you do that? That's, of course, another uh, uh, story. And I hope I can show you some examples of applications in this area uh, later on. We also have a data explosion in finance. I, I think that there are several people in the audience here that are familiar with this uh, type of phenomenon. It's, it's recently new that also banks and the financial sector start doing a lot of uh, uh, big data and serious data mining. And of course, you have all these technical domains. I'm not going to elaborate in detail. You have things like uh, network security, you have profiling, you have visual media sensor data. These are all domains, retail, finance, and so on, where, of course, increasingly we get uh, a tsunami of uh, data that generate this data science uh, domain. One of my PhD students, who is more of the philosopher uh, type, uh, said, look, there's a fourth paradigm. And we can, we can debate about that, but, but I kind of like the idea that he said, look, in uh, a millennium ago, uh, a lot of what we had in scientific insights was empirical. I mean, we, we looked at the world around us and we tried to deduce some of the laws. And, and that's like science was done. If, if that title already existed like a thousand years ago. A few centuries ago, think of Newton. What they basically did is they started using and inventing mathematics to come up with uh, theoretical models. Think of Newton laws and so on and so forth. And uh, of course, in, in the 20th century with Moore's law, 
uh, science was driven by, by a lot of computations and, and we are still doing a lot of uh, computational things. Uh, think of all the supercomputer initiatives in all the countries. And of course, uh, today, and that's a fourth paradigm, science is basically driven by data. I mean, we are overwhelmed with data and you are now confronted um, not with, I have an a hypothesis and I want to check it. No, you have data and the question is, what kind of hypothesis can I formulate and, and then later on uh, check it? So this data science area, data driven science, uh, data driven area is now coming faster towards us. Now I'm going to talk a bit about big data and, and all the dimensions you have to cope with when you're doing projects uh, in big data, but I'm going to go very fast over these uh, six uh, dimensions here. Uh, and basically you can um, uh, represent them in, in big circles. So first you have, of course, uh, the data themselves. Uh, you need to, to think about your computing infrastructure, especially when there's lots of data, when, when you have a tsunami of data. In some cases, uh, storage is also an issue uh, because, for instance, when you're working with, with a bank, uh, these are very confidential uh, data. And of course, the bank will maybe require that you work on the servers of the bank itself. I mean, this, this is kind of special requirement. Originally, we thought that the same would happen when you're doing genomics. But that's not the case. In, uh, apparently, in, in, um, there are, of course, privacy issues, but genetic data move around in Europe. Maybe you don't know that, but hospitals exchange genetic data and so on. It's, it's much more flexible, so to say, than the tradition in the banking uh, world. Um, of course, my field of speciality is more the mathematical engineering, it's the analytics. I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm, I'm only going to give you some, some surveys. Increasingly important is also visualization, uh, because if you have tsunami of data, you want in one way or another to, to get an initial visualization of what is available. And of course, you also want to visualize your result so that people can understand it uh, by showing uh, some pictures and some figures. And of course, you have to deal with um, uh, quite um, intricate security and, and privacy issues in most, uh, in most applications. And the next couple of slides detail that in, in uh, more or less uh, uh, detail. Uh, for instance, for data, you can, on the x-axis, you can talk about b batch data, uh, for instance, in a bank. But for instance, when you're dealing with um, mobile phone company, then you want maybe to process your data in real time. Uh, and that's, of course, um, a, a very important difference with uh, processing data in batch. And on the y-axis, you have the difference between structured data and unstructured data. And of course, these, uh, you have all the intermediate type of uh, uh, applications that can be sorted out on both of these uh, axes. For computing infrastructure, you have similar types of uh, trees, uh, batch streaming, and so on and so forth. So you understand I'm not going to, in, to go into detail, but these are all things that uh, expert will certainly understand that uh, you have this kind of uh, tree you have to cope with when you're talking about uh, computing infrastructure. And storage is the same, so you can uh, discuss about all kinds of uh, storage uh, challenges. Uh, you can here also uh, discuss about analytics, and I will elaborate a, a little bit on that uh, uh, in a minute. So uh, what do you want to do? How many samples do you have? Is it more like classification? Is it more like regression? Maybe you have dimensionality reduction problems, and so on and so forth. So I will show you some examples of that in the applications I'm going to uh, show you. Uh, visualization is also uh, important. Uh, if you ask me, there's still a lot to do there. Um, uh, for research because it's maybe kind of underrated type of research but visualization is increasingly important. Visualization of complex data set of lots of data is uh, really a challenge on how to do that. And of course, you have always have in, in, in many applications and especially in the serious data and the serious mining applications, you have a lot of uh, security issues and a lot of uh, privacy uh, issues. Now, one thing that I also want to say is that increasingly you find, and it's, it's something I also learned only the last year, but there is a notion that is called, um, so these are all companies that are active in, in data mining and, and you can also cluster them and order them according to applications and fields in which they are working. But one thing that is maybe also nice to know is that more and more analytics is used as a commodity. So increasingly you have these websites, web applications, where you can send in your data and then 
some results come back. I mean, it's completely black box. And of course, you have to trust it in one way or another. But increasingly in companies, uh, these things are used. And of course, we can be critical about that because nobody really knows what's in there. But to give you one example, if, if I go to the academic hospital in Leuven, they use these, these kind of black box tools and they use um, a, a Google tool for that. So when a patient gets into the hospital, they take all the clinical data of the patient. Uh, they, they try to, to guess the pathology that he or she has. And they use such a black box tools to predict the average duration of stay in the hospital. And that seems to work very well. And of course, it's for them, it's very important because they have to schedule. They have about 500,000 consultations per year in a hospital. Not all of these people stay there during the night, of course, but you want to schedule logistically uh, that flow of patients uh, through, throughout the weeks. And they use one of these black box tools and we ask them, why do you use a black box tools? And it's very easy, they say it works. Uh, and they have lots of data, so they have no problem of data. They have 500,000 consultations per year. And it's maybe a non-critical application. I mean, it's kind of predicting the average duration of that patient. So that's maybe something that we should be aware of that increasingly as researchers, it's, it's a challenge because you have to cope with these kind of black box things. And I would invite all PhD students, if you have an algorithm here, just try to throw in your data in one of these commodity type of things and see maybe your results are even better uh, than the algorithm you are trying to design. Uh, of course, you don't know what's happening, uh, what the algorithms are and so on and so forth. So that's, of course, a point of uh, critique for these things. Now, basically, um, what our uh, expertise is, uh, of my research group is in uh, numerical algorithms because in analytics you have two big schools. You have, uh, let's say, the, the expert system type of approach, the, the artificial intelligence, the rule-based type of things, typically in computer science. But I'm trained as a, a system theoretical guy, a dynamical systems guy, and so um, Bjorn referred to numerical linear algebra, so that's why we started concentrating on, on what we call numerical algorithms. And I admit you have a kind of continuum uh, because you can have numerical algorithms that can be interpreted in a kind of rule-based way and the other way around, so maybe this distinction is a bit fake, but nevertheless these are two big schools in what uh, is considered to be a, a machine learning. Um, now, when you start a project, um, in my experience, we have learned uh, never to confront the customer right away with your expertise because they, it will be a non-discussion, it will be a non-conversation. If you start telling them about uh, random forest trees and about support vector machines and so on and so forth, I mean, they, they, they go mazurk. And basically, the, the, the first thing you need to try to find out is the objectives that are domain specific in the language of the customer. So you have to be a little bit um, patient and uh, that's not exactly a quality of, of many engineers. They, they are kind of impatient, but this human factor of trying to find out what the objectives are in the language of the customer is a very important part of a project. And so here you see all kinds of objectives uh, in, the, in the ICT world. Uh, uh, it could be like um, uh, uh, privacy, digital signing, for instance. It could be like some problem in communication networks and so on. And so part of the um, adjective uh, series in my presentation is that you cannot ju just do data mining on a bunch of data. You really need to understand what your customer, what your partner in the project is, is wanting and typically they, they don't manage to explain to you in technical terms what they want, but they can explain it in their own uh, words. And here you see things like, for instance, from the finance uh, sector, it could be fraud detection, it could be a risk assessment, uh, there could be timing issues involved, it could be portfolio management. These are the words that people use in, in a financial world. And typically, if you confront them with a data scientist who is trained as an engineer or as a computer scientist, then, of course, they don't speak this language either. So you have there a big gap between the languages that uh, both parties uh, speak at a certain moment. Here's another nice application area of, uh, of, of data mining. It's education. You know about MOOCs, these massive open source uh, courses. Uh, that are initiated uh, by, by big universities like Stanford, uh, Coursera, and uh, MIT. They have a platform called edX. 
And of course, there's a lot of data mining applications there. Uh, one of the courses in machine learning in Stanford uh, is, is um, taught for more than 150,000 uh, students. And then, of course, uh, that's a lot of students. And about uh, 30,000 of these students, they want to have a certificate. So th this means they take an exam, they take a test, and you have to ask yourself, how are we going to grade? How are we going to correct this test of 30,000 people? You know, when, when I tell this to my colleagues in Leuven, they always go like, oh, 150,000 students. Yeah, but there's a dropout of about 120,000 students. Yes, but 30,000 of them take a certificate. That, that's a higher number than you will ever teach in your whole life. I mean, that's the impact of, of these uh, uh, MOOCs. And these American universities are very clever because if you look at the gradings, then you can select, of course, the top 100 uh, students and you offer them a PhD position. I mean, it's a worldwide recruitment thing and you save a lot of money because you don't have to, to do uh, international recruiting and so on and so forth. But how do you grade such a thing? Of course, you could uh, say, I'm going to do multiple choice. And that's, of course, the most stupid thing you could do. Some do it like that. But you have increasingly many, many more advanced grading systems that are based on data mining. Uh, you can also monitor the website that they are using and if there are exercise sessions on there, you can monitor that website and see with which exercises the students are struggling. And this is probably a kind of bottleneck in, in your course and you have to work on that to make it more easily uh, digestible and so on and so forth. So that's student performance. You can also, uh, if, if I come back to the grading system, a clever way of grading is what you all did in the school eh, when your teacher was lazy and you have 30 <coughs> pupils in the class, then you say, look, you are going to correct each other's exam. And you make a random shuffle of the exams. And, and they have, you, you put the right answers on the blackboard, and they have to grade. That's one clever system what, what they do with 30,000 students. So they shuffle. And as a second assignment, you have to correct uh, the exams of somebody else. Uh, and so there are many issues here. I mean, it's a very creative thing, this uh, educational type of uh, uh, detecting plagiarism is, of course, data mining. And, at my universities, all the master's thesis have to be submitted electronically, and we run them through an engine that tries to detect whether there is uh, plagiarism. Okay, So that's kind of like text mining, correlation analysis, and so on. Smart cities, an incredible number of applications, uh, predictive maintenance, uh, uh, traffic management, that's, that's hopeless in my eyes. But uh, flood prediction is another. I will show you an example of that uh, in a minute. And then, of course, in health, uh, I should not tell you, there is an increasing number of uh, applications uh, in clinical applications, in, in uh, uh, decision support uh, systems to make a diagnosis, to monitor a therapy, and so on and so forth. So this is all data-based. Uh, there are lots of um, multimodal data, so you can have images, you can have genomics, uh, genetic data, you can have proteomics, protein data, and so on and so forth. You can have uh, text data, and, and there are all kinds of technologies that you can use uh, in order to build a decision support system. And I will give you some examples of that. And then we gradually zoom in. We, we leave the world of, of the domain experts. And then we start translating uh, the whole um, uh, project into words that engineers understand. So you, 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 you start talking about prediction. I mean, it's a kind of uh, educational thing you also do with the domain expert. You, you tell him what, what, that you can predict something and how you can predict it. Or you can maybe cluster and classify something. Fraud detection is like a clustering exercise or a class, class classification exercise. Uh, anomalies, uh, outlier detection, and so on. So gradually, you bring your customer into the more technical world of uh, data science and statistics and, and mathematics. Uh, you can have um, uh, normalization issues. For instance, if you have a phenomenon that is uh, climate dependent, uh, I will show you an example of the power consumption in a country where, of course, the power consumption is different in the winter and in the summer, and it's different on a Sunday from on a Monday. So you have these kind of cyclic things in your data. And you want to get rid of the cyclic phenomenon, and they call that process normalization. So you want to normalize. Uh, you can define what is a normal day, uh, be it a Saturday or be it a Monday, and that's called a normalization. I will show you in a minute. Ranking is, of course, very important. Uh, 
if you are working in a medical environment and you are trying to discover which genes are important in a certain disease, you want a tool that ranks the genes according to their relevance with respect to the symptoms you see in that disease. And of course, Google is one big ranking machine, but you can make dedicated machines uh, to rank genes, for instance. And increasingly important is also data fusion because you can have several sources of uh, measurements of sensors that tell you something about the same type of uh, phenomenon. Think of disease again, we can look at, at your clinical um, uh, data, so the ones that we can measure, your temperature and so on. We can look at uh, images, we can look at uh, genetics, we can look at uh, 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 tissue and so on and so forth. So these are all several sources of data and you want to combine them in one engine that supports a certain decision of the medical doctor. And then the next thing you do is you start trying to explain in easy words what regression is. Uh, because you, in a bank you are confronted with a lot of people that have done economics. They say they know what regression is, but we are not quite sure about that we speak the same language there, so we show some picture. And this is of course a linear regression, but you can also have uh, things like nonlinear regression. Uh, you can also try to visualize classification. Uh, and this is a small question I'm going to ask you. It's two, two national teams that play soccer against each other and you have to guess what the teams are. So we see uh, uh, supporters uh, in the stadium that are, have black hair or blonde hair and that are either short or long and you have some, some in between there. So I'm, I let you guess Bjorn what are the national teams that, that play against each other here. <coughs> who, do, who do you think is blonde and long? <laughs> <laughs> that must be Swedes, of course. <laughs> and black and short must be Spanish or, or Italians. But actually, we don't know because the blonde and long could also be Dutch guys. I mean, if we are prejudiced, they could also be Dutch, uh, Dutch guys. And so, say, say, said in other words, if, if I look at the color of the hair and if I look at the length of the people, I don't have enough information to decide. So I need to bring in another feature, as they call it, and that's the color of the clothes. And of course, I see that some of them are wearing blue and other ones are wearing orange. And so, of course, now it's obvious that it's a match of Italy against the Netherlands. And by this simple example, I have shown you many things. Basically, I've told you about features and I've told you about the fact that we have to think in high dimensional spaces. I mean, two dimensions were not sufficient to make a decision. We need three dimensions. And in genetics, we maybe need 10,000 dimensions, okay? So that's the idea of dimensions. And many people, many normal people, they, they struggle with the notion of dimensions. I mean, four dimensions and five dimensions, what is this? And we, we think of a vector with five numbers, but, but if you try to visualize this, is, is, is of, of course uh, uh, impossible. I've, I've told you about features. These are the axes, the things you measure. And of course, you can also combine features and so on. Uh, I, I've told you the notion about clusters in this example. I mean, these supporters, they cluster together based on their features. I've told you about similarity because you have to define what you mean by similarity. And then you also have to define a decision criterion by which you will allocate a certain supporter to the Italians or to the, the, the Dutch uh, uh, team, or you don't know, that's somewhere in between. And so this is basically the essence, all clustering classification algorithms can be kind of scored and compared to each other based on these uh, four or five uh, defining elements. And, and that's a very nice illustration. Outlier detection is of course obvious when you have a point that is not typical, but then you have to realize that an outlier is all, always outlying with respect to a certain model. So of course what you define to be an outlier is related to what you define to be normal. And first you need to define what, what is normal of course, and that's uh, part of the job you have to do. And normalization is uh, illustrated here. You see here for instance the power consumption at one transformer post in, uh, in Belgium during a week. There are 168 hours in a week. And 168, Bjorn always reminds me of our common mentor, uh, Thomas Kailat. Uh, we had a meeting with our promoter every week in, in Stanford or every 14 days. And one of his opening sentences was there are 168 hours in a week. What have you done this week? Uh, and that was kind of very <laughs> confronting when he said something like that. I always started by saying, well, you know, 15 hours, uh, that's none of your business. 
and then you have another 50 hours, 49 hours or 50 hours uh, to, to sleep. That leaves 100 hours. And then we can debate about those 100 hours. That's a <laughs> so you have this daily cycle there. And it's obvious here that a Saturday is very much different from a Friday in power consumption. Now, when you try to model this, typically what statisticians would do is they would consider this to be a kind of time series. And they, they try to model the power consumption on a Saturday as a function of the five preceding days, because it's a, it's a time, they say it's a time series. So there, and of course, that's obviously the, the worst thing you can do, because a Saturday, as you see here, does not look like a Friday. A Friday looks like a Thursday, but a Saturday does not look like a Friday. So when you do regression here, you have, have to regress the Saturdays on the Saturdays, not on the Fridays. And so that's one of these things that you, sometimes you have to reorganize your data. When there is a priori information, you have to exploit that a priori information. And I come back to that uh, later on. Ranking, you all know Google, so I don't have to explain ranking. It's, it's relevance, uh, it's ordering according a certain relevance uh, measure where you say this is most relevant uh, and so on and so forth. And then data fusion. Um, here you have an example of uh, credit cards, uh, transaction behavior over time. And of course, it's, it's very difficult to detect fraud here unless you bring in another source, which is location. And then you can basically say that the same card is, is used twice in a short period at a different location. So that allows you to distinguish uh, between fraud and non-fraud. So this is a combination of, of the card using database and of a certain uh, location uh, database. Now, typically when we do a project, uh, first you have to understand the problem. And again, engineers are typically very impatient to understand the problem. I mean, you need to, to talk it over and over again until you really think you, you understand what they have in mind. Also from the other side, from the non-engineering side, it, it's sometimes very challenging to formulate a problem. I mean, what is your problem? What do you want to do? And that typically takes uh, quite a while uh, in, in the course of a project. And so basically, this is an intake. Uh, this is understand the field of study. So you might have to study something uh, in which you are not familiar. 15 years ago, I decided to spend my summer holidays in studying genetics. I took three big books of genetics, and I'm a complete autodidact in genetics. But it's needed when you're dealing with doctors, with geneticists, then you need to understand their language. You need to understand what's going on. Understand the objectives, understand the data. and. <laughs> Basically, at a certain moment, you say you together, we understand uh, the problem. We have not solved it, but at least we understand what the problem is. And then comes another very boring phase in a project that's prepared the data. Uh, and that's also something which is largely ignored in many applications. Basically, what you see here is a picture of a drug discovery project where the data are proteins. Proteins, I mean, we're working here with a pharmaceutical company, so they are proteins and they are molecules. Proteins are targets in the body in which mo molecules that are in a drug can interact with. And of course, this is data. I mean, they give you the formulas of these proteins. They are geometrical information because the folding of a protein is very important. So you can characterize this. You have uh, biochemical information. You have chemical affinities and so on and so forth. You, you can do quantum mechanical computations. I mean, this is all done by, by specialists. But basically, you need to do that in order to bring all of this information, which is non-numerical, you have to bring it in the, in, the, in the kind of numerical world. And that's a kind of translation thing that is, uh, cannot be underestimated. It, it occurs in almost all applications. Uh, if, if I give you genetic information, it's non-numerical. You have to translate this into your numerical world. So you need this kind of translational module that uh, prepares the data. And of course, you can have lots of other problems, uh, missing values in the data. That, that's also very important. Or data sequences that are not synchronized, and, and, and they should be synchronized, and so on and so forth. Uh, different lengths of data records, uh, and they, they, you, you would expect to have them the same length, and so on and so forth. So the data cleaning and the data translation is also a very, very important uh, 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 um, part of a project. Actually, when I'm invited to join, to apply for a common project, and we are supposed to be the data scientists, and uh, for instance, I'm now talking to some guys from material science, 
to do a kind of data mining material science project, and I will show you another example. Um, we only do the project when we are sure about the data, because in the past I've started many projects, and of course you are waiting for the data, these guys are doing all their experiments and so on and so forth, and then the data come like one month before the deadline that the project should be finished, and then of course it's impossible to do something meaningful. So when we negotiate a project now, we, we have to be sure about the data. We only go for the, the money is tempting, but we only do it when, uh, when we are sure about the data because everybody, otherwise everybody is losing his or her time. Handling the data, security issues, analytics. Uh, if we are here in, in the purple box, then we are playing at home. So we really like to be in this box, but I want to convey the message that before you are in this box, it's blood, sweat and tears uh, if you do a typical project in, uh, in uh, big data. And then of course handling uh, the results is uh, trying to, to, to achieve uh, insight in the fact that the results are meaningful for the customer. Is that what they expect? Uh, can you explain in their words again what your algorithms have done? If you have done a certain classification, is it meaningful? Does it make sense? Uh, in their application, that's also a very um, important step because you can show them the results, but, but if, if you just show them numbers, then for them, of course, it's also very difficult to interpret. And uh, only when you survive that last step, you can say you have solved uh, the problem. Now, let me take you through some uh, examples of uh, applications. I'm going to skip this. Uh, Bjorn told about uh, the spin-off uh, uh, companies, uh, so one of them is in chemical uh, process industry, that's IPCOS. Uh, we have another company that's doing data mining in um, uh, traffic management uh, situations. Uh, I'm going to show you some results about Cartagena, what, which is a, a genetic data mining company, and I will come back in some examples to one, some of these companies. you find more details about these companies uh, in the slides. Now, one thing that I, I did last year is looking back uh, to the times of uh, Stanford and trying to make an inventory of what we have been doing the last 20 years on algorithms that we have in-house. And that's a kind of very interesting exercise because first of all, you forget lots of it. Second, we are in this science business, which basically means that uh, you have PhD students, they publish and then they leave the house and then basically you forget about their algorithms and their results and some of them are not really nicely documented and so on and so forth. So we decided uh, that, that we should try to reverse that. And we went back 20 years and we made this kind of matrix, if you want, of, of methods. And this is now very important for new projects and for new PhD students because we can now really say, okay, you should start reading this or that. If, if you have a big research group uh, that has been active for more than 20 years, I can guarantee you that there are hundreds and hundreds of papers and that there are software packages and so on and so forth. And when you do this exercise, you find out that, that many of these things that have been done in the past are still largely relevant for what you do today. But because we publish and we also want to always want to publish new results, we kind of ignore the expertise that we have in our own research group. And that's the exercise that is uh, visualized uh, here. Now, there is a lot of things that um, uh, this is another level of presenting problems. Um, uh, that come from system theory, because I think the, the new generation of data mining challenges will also exploit the fact that we deal with dynamical systems. So this means that we talk about time series, we talk about uh, uh, systems in which dynamics also reveal a lot of properties or anormalities of, uh, of the system. And data simulation is, is one of these examples. Uh, uh, the example we show here is climate control where basically you have um, only a limited number of sensors. And if you talk to numerical people that come from numerical analysis, they, they did some very weird things because they have, uh, let's say, open loop models. They kind of have Navier-Stokes as equations. They discretize it and then they simulate. But of course, if you simulate partial differential equations, you have two problems. You have to um, uh, be sure that the model is correct. I mean, we assume that. But you have to start with boundary conditions and you have to start with initial conditions. 
And of course, when you don't know this, and typically in climate, you, do, you don't know what the climate is at the boundaries of Belgium, and you don't know, maybe you know the initial condition, but you know, don't know it at every place, you only know it at the sensor places. So they do a kind of open loop simulation. And then they compare the simulation with the measurements. And they see that the, the two don't match. And what they then do, they formulate a kind of nonlinear optimization problem by which they start fiddling around with, with the boundary conditions and with the initial conditions, which is, of course, an incredibly complex uh, optimization problem. And then they run it over and over again until the two are gradually convergent or non-convergent at all. And so it takes um, uh, system theory guys to say, look, what are you doing? I mean, this is a kind of crazy approach because you have a model and you, you see that it doesn't match with the data. You have to start with the data, of course. I mean, the data don't lie, you have measured them. And first you have to model these data. So we do it the other way around. We model with dynamical models the data, and then we try to estimate the unknown quantities in the whole model. So you can estimate the boundary conditions, you can estimate the initial conditions, and people here that know about Kalman filtering kind of understand what I'm talking about. So you can estimate these things by doing it the other way around. First start with data, then model, and then try to estimate unknown quantities. Uh, decision trees, I'm not going to talk about it. I will show you some regression type of things. Support vector machines is one of these uh, nice ideas where basically, if you try to understand the support vector machine apart from the mathematics, but basically support vector machine is uh, an algorithm that translates a classification exercise and you want to distinguish here uh, between the, the, the green dots and the blue dots. And you see it's a nonlinear decision boundary. And a, and a support vector machine kind of projects the data into a higher dimensional space in which all the nonlinearities disappear. And in this kind of very easy example, you can imagine that you attach a third dimension to this data set and that the blue ones stay on the zero level and that the green ones go up to a level one. I mean, in the third dimension, you, you bring them in a, in a z-axis on level one. And then, of course, it's linearly separable, okay? So it's a very easy exercise to separate them by thinking in a third dimension. And that's exactly what support vector machines do. So you can have incredibly complex optimization problems or classification problems in a low number of dimensions, but the support vector machine by some magical trick, they call it the kernel trick, as you see there, it's, it's a mathematical theorem. They project the, the data to a higher dimensional space, in some cases, an infinite dimensional space that really challenges your imagination, but it can be done. And implicitly, you linearize the whole problem and you make it a kind of regression problem or a very easy linear problem in a high number of space. It comes at the price of having to deal with, with high dimensional matrices. So the, the size of the problem can become very large, but we have more slow, so we have uh, uh, computers that can help us there. Another nice idea is manifold learning because you can have a data set that looks very difficult, but basically in a high dimensional space you can maybe model it and you see that this data set can be modeled in, in a kind of two dimensional space, but it's curved. So it's a manifold in a high, embedded in a higher dimensional space. And that's also a nice idea to try to find the model that explains your data and that will solve a lot of uh, data science and data mining uh, problems. Maybe this one also, increasingly the number of data we are dealing with are not vectors or matrices, but they are tensors. Um, if we take a scan of your brain, so a scan is a kind of two-dimensional section of a certain level in your brains, it, it's an image, and for each pixel in that image, you can uh, have a spectrum that reveals the chemical composition of that pixel, okay? So for a two-dimensional section of your brains, you have a third dimension that reveals the chemical the com uh, composition of that pixel. And now you do that for every section in your brain. So you have three-dimensional object, which is with voxels, and for every voxel, you have a spectrum. And that's an example of a four-dimensional tensor. If that whole thing evolves as a function of time, you are being treated for a tumor, that tumor decreases, then that's a fifth dimension. It's a five-dimensional tensor. And so increasingly, we are confronted with data objects which are uh, asking for 
numerical linear algebra techniques to decompose a tensor, just like you can decompose a matrix, for instance, via the singular value decomposition, you have higher order generalizations of SVDs for tensors, and that is also a tool that we increasingly use uh, in uh, a lot of applications. So let me conclude with, with showing you some, some applications. I'm not going to tell you about the technical details, but I hope to inspire you a bit by, by the wealth of applications. Uh, I'm going maybe not to show them all in detail, but uh, energy, industry, environment, uh, social networks, finance and fraud and health. Maybe I'm going to concentrate on, on energy, on um, the, the, the uh, finance and fraud and on the health, uh, and I will just go very quickly to all the rest. So here is a, a, an example of um, a load forecast uh, problem. So you see here the power grid uh, in Belgium, and, and there you see the, the high power grid. And basically the number of measurements uh, came from ALIA. ALIA is the national um, power grid operator in, in Belgium. And we also used meteorological data here, so from the, the National Weather Institute in Belgium, which is based in Brussels. And basically what we got as data uh, were uh, five-year data, uh, 3,000 transformer posts measured every 15 minutes, they measured the power consumption. And also from the weather station, we get five years of, of weather data day by day. We had sun data, we had cloudiness data, we had temperature and so on, because of course the, the sun, the, 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 the amount of sun and the amount of clouds also determine the, the power consumption. When, it's sun, when it would be sunny now, then uh, we would need less heating than uh, under the current uh, circumstances. And this is how one transformer post looks like. Uh, so it's one post for one week. You see there the 168 hours. Uh, you see the cyclic behavior, the, the working days in the week. Uh, you see the weekend. And you also see that such a transformer post uh, can have a different absolute scale depending on the season. The colors are here, winter, spring, uh, summer and fall. And basically you have uh, a lot of these transformer posts uh, in, in Belgium. And they were interested in predicting um, the, the behavior of every transformer post, but also in clustering the type of customers that is behind such a transformer post. Are it assholes? Are it uh, uh, big companies? And so on and so forth. So they tried to find out what their uh, uh, classes of customers are. And they also try to find out the trend. So they have five years and they really want to know is power consumption growing? Is it stable? Is it decreasing? And so on and so forth. And of course, with such a data set, it's, it's very difficult to, to see this at first sight. So this is what the data set looks like. You have the hours, you have the weeks, and you have uh, all the transformer posts and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's a very interesting data set. Uh, you can cluster them, for instance, and here is another very interesting research topic. So when you are looking for new research topics, then one important one is how do you cluster time series? Uh, because typically what people do is they, cluster, they, they put a time series in a long vector, and they do that for all the time series they have, and then they use their usual cluster measures, distance measures for vectors. For instance, they look at the correlation angle. Okay, that's absolutely bad to do because I always give my students the example if you have a sine wave and you put that in a vector and you have a cosine and you put that in another vector, I let you guess what the angle is between the two vectors. It's 90 degrees. So you will say they are not correlated. I forgot to tell you that the sine and the cosine have the same frequency. So you will say they are not correlated. My God, they are perfect. It's the same system. You only started measuring the, 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 the one single with a time delay, okay? But it's the same dynamical system. So it means that when you cluster time series, you really have to think hard on how to do that. And it's, it's kind of an open problem. We know how to do that. We have a theory for ARMA models. These are dynamical systems that are driven by white noise, linear systems. We know how to do that for ARMA. We don't know how to do that for any other system. If it's a nonlinear, neural network that has generated these time series. We don't, we don't know of a theory to cluster time series. So that's really an open, let's say, applied mathematical problem, which would be very uh, useful. But here you see some uh, clustering exercise on these transformer posts, and you see typical different behaviors. So that's already very revealing that they see that. Of course, you can uh, use the models that you derive to forecast uh, depending on weather situations. 
um, uh, and, and actually this problem is very, um, very uh, important in Belgium now because, you know, we are closing down all those nuclear plants. And uh, one big problem is, will we survive the coming winter? Okay, because uh, w will we have to import uh, energy from Germany or from France, maybe from France, because they have lots of nuclear energy there. But you have constraints there because you cannot over uh, charge your grid. I mean, there, there are security measures and so on and so forth. So an accurate forecast is, is really critical these days. And actually, they're using these algorithms to, to forecast, uh, uh, to, 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 to make out the worst case uh, scenarios. And here you see that these uh, predictions work uh, quite well. And I will come back to the example later. Let me skip the industry here. Let me maybe give you, because we are in Luxembourg and, and steel industry uh, is still a, a big, uh, important thing here. And so this is a nice illustration of um, a, a material science uh, problem. Basically, they are making alloys here. So the company you see there. And the alloys consist of 10 different materials. And they want to predict uh, the melting point of an alloy, uh, which is made uh, in, in, in different concentrations of these 10 different materials. So now you have to visualize a kind of 10-dimensional tensor. Every axis is the composition of a material. I mean, let's, let's sample it in 10%, 20%, and so on. And then you do that for 10 materials. And then you have this box. It's a kind of 10-dimensional box. And every point in that box is an alloy with a certain composition. And now you want to predict the melting point and maybe other properties of that, uh, of that uh, alloy. And basically, um, what they can do is they, it's what is called the curse of dimensionality because you basically have 10 to the power 10 points in that object. And of course, it's, it's impossible to, to experimentally <laughs> do all of this. You can do a couple of experiments, which means that you know certain points in that, in that big matrix. And then the problem is in that big tensor, the problem is can you predict uh, the melting point in the other things? If you represent it as a tensor, it's, it's hopeless. But if you represent it as a decomposed tensor, then you really break the curse of dimensionality. And basically what we see here is that you can decompose this 10-dimensional tensor in, in rank 1 tensors. And if you keep on adding rank 1 tensors, ultimately you find back the, the original tensor. But and it's visualized here for three dimensions, but you have to imagine it in 10 dimensions. So if I approximate this 3D tensor with an outer product of three vectors, and I stop here, then it's a rank one approximation, then I need much less parameters than to model the whole thing. And that's basically the idea they exploit here. Um, by truncating this decomposition up to a certain level, they only need 4,500 uh, uh, 4, parameters instead of 10 to the power 10. And it works very well in predicting the melting temperatures. I'm not going to much in detail here, but it's a paper that was written by uh, Lee van der Lottauer, and it's a very nice application of uh, tensor decompositions uh, to predicting uh, melting uh, temperatures of uh, alloys. Uh, let me skip this one. It's a climate uh, model. I'm not going to elaborate. But let me show you some journal clustering, and I also show it for Bjorn, because there's another good friend of Bjorn that will figure in the pictures here. So basically, you have a lot of journals, and increasingly, all of them are electronic. And of course, you can do a lot of uh, social networks uh, basically uh, based on uh, these uh, electronic databases. And uh, one of the things you can do is, is cluster journals, for instance. And there are some people uh, in the audience here that are working with natural language processing. And uh, that is also basically what we do here, text mining. So your matrices here are like word document matrices. So you have a vocabulary of words. And you count the occurrence of certain words in the documents uh, that you are uh, investigating. And then you can do all kinds of clustering exercises here. You see that you have certain things like cell, gene, and tumor. And you have 19 hits that uh, it's a kind of query machine that you can say what papers are uh, relevant if I'm looking for cell, gene, and tumor. And you can click on that, and then you will get uh, these papers back. You can do clustering in. Uh, in uh, disciplines. Also very interesting is if you do this in time, you see that certain interdisciplinary journals become more and more important as time goes by. So you see the, the birth of uh, interdisciplinary journals. 
Author collaboration clustering is, of course, also interesting to look at. This is my, uh, my personal uh, uh, co-workers network. So I'm here in the center and uh, you see that these are PhD students. You see this is my bioinformatics work and, and here you are more in my systems and, and control work. So it's very nice to apply this uh, to your own uh, publication thing. Uh, and this is a picture of Jean Gollop, you know uh, Jean Gollop who, who deceased, but uh, this is a, a co-worker's picture. And this is um, uh, the picture of uh, Leonard Jung, who is another mentor of us, um, uh, of uh, Sweden also. Uh, and this was made when he got an honorary degree in Leuven a couple of years ago. And you see there the several clusters of authors uh, in several fields that he has been working in. And that's also very uh, interesting to, to analyze. Uh, and you see, by the way, that sometimes our algorithms fail because there's another Leonard Jung who is a geneticist and who has nothing to do with the one we are talking about here. Uh, and, and that's, of course, also a, a, a nice application domain in what is called scientometrics. Now, let me give you an example of uh, fraud detection uh, before I conclude. Uh, one of the projects we have done like, like 10 years ago was fraud detection on a mobile phone network. And this morning we had a PhD presentation uh, exactly on fraud detection, but, but in banks. But, and, and there was a discussion on how do you determine the features. And in mobile phone uh, uh, applications, the features are basically here sitting on top. So you have short duration calls, so it can be uh, text messages, you have long duration, you have high frequency, the frequency of calling, international or not, same destination. I mean, there are like 40 parameters uh, that uh, are monitored. Uh, in, in, in such a, a project. And then you have a whole list of possible frauds because you would think that uh, stealing your, your mobile phone is, is one problem, but there are many more problems these days. I mean, sometimes your phone is hacked uh, by somebody else to get into your local computer network and so on and so forth. So they have a whole list of uh, uh, possible frauds and uh, uh, the exercise is basically can you uh, find an algorithm, a method to detect as soon as possible the fraud. And this is run online, so it's a technical challenge because if you, uh, this was a project with Proximus, which is one of the uh, mobile phone providers in Belgium, two million customers, and you can assume that uh, each of them call like 10 times a day. Uh, and uh, you have to do this online. So every hour they run the whole algorithm and they have a ranking and they only concentrate on the 100 most suspicious cases of that hour. And they will try to identify these guys. Uh, and if that doesn't work out in, let's say, half an hour, they will shut you off. And to give you an idea, in Paris, I don't know about Brussels, but in Paris, I know the numbers, there are 400 mobile phones stolen every day. Uh, and what typically what the thieves do is they rent it on the street and you can use their phone for some money to call your family in, I should be very careful now, in some very foreign country, very far away. <laughs> <coughs> and then of course, after two hours, they throw away the phone. So you have like two hours <laughs> to try to identify uh, whether it's the original person or not. By the way, identifying school kids is very easy in this exercise. Because when I look at my kids, when I get them from school at four o'clock in the afternoon, the first thing they start doing is sending text messages to their friends. And then I always say to them, look, I mean, you just saw them like, like 10 minutes ago. What, what are you now? Me oh, I'm messaging I'm on the way home, you know. Basically, in this matrix, you see that at 3.30 3 and 4, you have a big peak in, in text messages. So it suffices to look at that feature to say it's a school kit. Okay, so you can always be, so that's an easy one. But of course you have many more uh, things and, and you see here a two dimensional, so these are the dimensions. They are about 40 parameters they, ma they, they monitor. And this is a two dimensional sexual call frequency and average call duration. And then you see you have a nonlinear classification problem there. In this exercise, basically what they did is they modeled the individual profile of every customer. So when we trace you for, uh, for, let's say, one month in a row, you make 10 phone calls a day. After one month, in that 40-dimensional space, you have, uh, let's say, like 300 points. It's a cloud of points in that 40-dimensional space, and we make a statistical model of that cloud of points. And of course, fraud detection is outlier detection, so we compare every new phone call that is made with your phone, we compare it to your typical model, okay? 
And I understand from Bjorn that this was a project 10 years ago, that today that would be much more difficult because the mobile phone companies don't allow profiling anymore because they are scared that you would use that profile for other reasons than fraud detection, okay? And so there's an issue there because you could use a profile, of course, it's very interesting for marketing purposes. If, 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 if you can look at your profile, then we can offer you new services and so on and so forth. So increasingly, uh, and we talked about that over lunch, in many of these applications, you are confronted with these type of ethical issues. I mean, what can you do and what can you not do? But let's say 10 years ago, this was not yet a, a big issue. And this was installed uh, with Proximus in an, a kind of real-time modus. And um, it, it basically uh, works, so uh, there's a nice uh, return on investment. Let me go to my last... Uh, Example, I will skip these, but this is biomedical applications and we have been working uh, since 15 years in bioinformatics and we have done the same type of uh, taxonomy uh, in, in our biomedical research group. So this is the current people and you see that uh, some of them are working in, in diseases and in, in tissue. Uh, others are more working on, on the technological platforms. You see mass spectrometry here, which is proteomics, genomics, and so on. And then, of course, we also have a lot of uh, IT people that are doing the databases, the, the visualization, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's always very interesting to make this type of, uh, of matrices. Now, I will show you one or two cases here to, to give you kind of touch and feel of the state of the art in, in this type of research. This is um, with a colleague of mine, Dirk Timmerman. This is actually the queen of Belgium, so he's getting this award. She is not a partner in our project, but uh, he's getting an award from her. And uh, he's a specialist in ovarian cancers. And basically, what they try to do is based on, on images, but also increasingly on um, genetic data and proteomics data and blood samples and so on and so forth, they try to assess uh, with, uh, whether, where, whether the woman has an ovarian cancer or not, and they try also to classify the cancer. You have about 40 different types of ovarian cancer, and of course uh, uh, you try to make a decision support tool that guides the medical doctor in making the diagnosis. There's an important point here. We never say we do the diagnosis ourselves. We call it very explicitly a decision support tool, because if you say you are going to make the decision, then of course the doctors will not like that. They have the medical responsibility. But of course I will show you that our algorithms are very good. It's just like in, a, in, a, in an airplane where you have an, automate, an automated pilot, and of course the pilot will always say, I am the pilot. But 80% of the time he flies on the computer of, of the... And it's the same type of thing here. You only need the doctor when there is a serious problem. You only need the pilot when everything else fails. And that's uh, basically the same type of... Uh, message. That's always my reply to doctors when they say you cannot claim that you decide. Okay, we don't decide. Of course, in setting up such a, a project is, is a challenge in its own right because you need a lot of uh, patients. And you see here that these are typical international projects. We started with a third database of uh, 1,066 uh, patients. It's not trivial because you have to define the protocol by which all those medical doctors in all those hospitals are going to collect the data. You have to standardize the way that these data are collected. And that's very important if you don't do that, you get all kinds of data which you don't understand. So defining the protocol is, is a very important data preparation thing. I mean, it, it's even, it has to be done before you start doing uh, the, the data mining. And so in the second phase, we increased that with another 2,000 uh, patients, uh, including Canada and China. And so the database uh, these days is about, it's, it's also a biobank. So when they, when they remove a tumor in a surgery, we can also have a, a sample, a tissue sent to us and we can analyze that genetically. And that's also used in, in such a project. What you see here is typically the receiver operating curves, the area under curve. I'm not going to explain it in detail, but you have uh, one minus the specificity and the sensitivity. And basically, the, the, the further that you are, the closer you are to the, the left uh, upper corner, the better the performance. And you see this uh, point here is Dirk Timmerman. He is the colleague I show you, the expert. And you see that uh, the, the generations of our algorithms are the different colors. They come closer and closer to what the expert is doing. And 
I cannot show this when this would be a medical audience because this is the typical behavior. We also do this blindly with medical doctors uh, in the field. And that's their performance here. So they are performing worse. They, uh, and, and I should I, I say too positive. They make mistakes, OK? They make mistakes. And uh, basically, they are performing worse than our best versions of our algorithms now. The models here are not really uh, very complicated at this moment, uh, but you see that even with, with relatively easy models, you can already design uh, quite some nice uh, algorithms. An important thing is here, we also discussed that uh, during lunch, is the privacy issue. Uh, we all agree that the privacy of a patient should be protected. I mean, all these data are anonymous. But if you look at certain laws, for instance, European laws, they basically say things that your, your data, your genetic data, that they are your personal property and that they cannot be shared by anybody else. And of course, that kills all population-based data mining. If we cannot share data, all our algorithms are based on, on populations. I mean, if you can only base yourself on one example, then, then it's silly, of course. It would be like a medical doctor if you erase the memory of a medical doctor after each new patient, then that would be no medical doctor. A medical doctor builds up experience because he sees a lot of patients. Well, these algorithms need the same thing. They become better and better as they treat more patients, as, as more patients, uh, data of more patients are treated. And, and population based is uh, basically very important. And that's why we say you share, uh, we care. So the sharing of data is a very important issue. Here's another example of a diagnostic tool that we develop. So these days you have a, a technology, and it, it's not so new anymore, it's 10 years old, but it's called a DNA chip. And so basically what that does is you have healthy tissue. You have uh, uh, a cancer, for instance, a tumor, and you can compare the behavior, the genetic behavior of these two tissues on a chip. So basically what this chip is, it contains something like 20,000 genes of healthy tissue on the chip, so it's, it's silicium with, uh, with some chemical process, you bind 20,000 genes there, and then you bring a sample, for instance a blood sample, you put it on there, and you look at the several reaction patterns. And when the reaction in, of, a, of a gene, every dot is a gene here, when the reaction pattern of a gene is the same in both tissues, then maybe the color is black. When it's really different, then maybe the color is, is, uh, is red. So here you see the difference and the similarity between the behavior of the gene in healthy tissue and in uh, ill tissue, in a tumor, for instance. And this is called a microarray. And basically, these are the data. So this is for one patient. So you vectorize this matrix. And so for one patient, you have one column here of this matrix here. And these are the genes. So every dot here is a gene. So these are the names of the genes. And basically, when you want to develop a diagnostic tool, you have a, a probabilistic problem, which is called bi-clustering. Because here, the columns are the patients, and the rows are the genes. And you want to reorder the rows, and you want to reorder the columns, until you see certain patterns appearing in that matrix. And that's what we have done. You see the result here, OK? So you see that you have here red and the rest is blue here. So this means that these patients, they have been reordered. They all have the same type of leukemia here. And that leukemia is revealed by these genes, OK? And another type of leukemia is revealed by other genes here. And another type of leukemia is revealed by these genes here. And actually, this type of leukemia was a leukemia that was not known. And by looking at the genetic signature, we found that it's basically a new class. Okay? So you find new types of leukemia by using data mining. Of course, it has to be clinically validated and so on and so forth. In the beginning, the doctors don't believe you. And they say, it's impossible. I mean, we have never seen that. And then, of course, you start doubting yourself. And you start digging into your algorithms again. And maybe there's something wrong there, and so on and so forth. But this is the way that new uh, diagnostic tools are discovered. So that's uh, one nice contribution uh, that was published. Here is another example of a data fusion. The problem here is you have a certain disease. And you want to know which genes really contribute to the origin of that disease. 
You can use microarrays, but you can also use uh, proteomics here, mass spectrometry. You can use um, other organisms. So you know that we have a lot of genetic similarity with, with, with apes, monkeys, with, with dogs and so on. They, they can do experiments on dogs and rats. That's very important. We cannot do it on humans. So you can use these results as additional data. They, they are proxies to, to, to what you try to investigate in human. You can also use text mining, of course. And basically, depending on the information source you use, you get different rankings. Okay, so maybe the, the proteins will tell you that uh, it's, it's a certain subset of genes that is most important for this disease. And the genetic information, the genetic experiment will tell you something otherwise. So there we use a kind of statistical thing by which we combine all these uh, information sources to come up with an ultimate ranking. It's a kind of consensus ranking that deals with a different type of complementary information or overlapping information, sometimes conflicting information. And that was a tool that was published in, in Nature Biotechnology a couple of years ago. And I think, uh, Bjorn, that I'm going to skip my final uh, uh, example. And uh, basically, I told you about big data, why it's important, the six dimensions, and I showed you some applications we have done ourselves in our research group. Thank you very much.